Welcome back to Morning Trade Live. It's time to go inside out on healthcare and biotech. Joining me right now, Sveta Kalinska, consulting founder and CEO of Rila Global. Thank you so much for being with us. Some of your thoughts on the big picture on these tariffs and what's the impact or what it could be? Good morning. So good to be here. Well, tariffs and in general conversations about uh, micro and macroeconomic effect that they have on pretty much every single industry. Uh, just in the last month alone, over 2 million people, consumers and investors have gone on social media pages and actually talked about tariffs and how they impact the day to day of actual consumers, but also of large companies. I know we're about to talk about biotech and some of the pharmaceutical companies who are also heavily uh, pretty much affected by these tariffs uh, and by what's happening on the macro level of our economic uh, situation right now. Understood. At this point now, though, um, you know, when investors look at this group, this was supposed to be a very lucrative, hot group for 2025. Is that still the case, do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime we talk about biotech and pharma, we just cannot not believe in science because obviously the performance and the companies that we're talking about are very, very strong performers with long term um, successes that they've had. Um, talking about and kind of like diving into one of uh, the companies, I'd like to mention Johnson & Johnson, uh, which over the last quarter have actually been the most vocal in terms of how China and the tariffs have really impacted them the most. Um, back in April, it was announced that they expect a $400 million uh, tariff-related cost related to devices and surgical products. And that's actually a big trend that we see across the pharma and the biotech world. World. So when we think of companies and pharmaceutical organizations, they don't just produce pharma um, and medicine. They actually very heavily focus on medical supplies and medical devices. So just a few minutes ago, you and Diane talked about steel and the tariffs that we see obviously impacting steel, which also very heavily ties into the pharma world and the biotech world. Uh, as we know that the products that go into medical devices and surgical devices are steel. Again, coming back to Johnson & Johnson, they also pretty recently within the Q1 uh, discussions mentioned that they are looking to bring uh, 55 billion in, in investment in the U.S. for basically any product that is made and targeted for U.S. production. Uh, so I'd love to see how that actually plays out uh, in the upcoming quarters. Abivax is on your radar. Why is that? Oh, I love European companies and I love also clinical stage organizations. So this is a very, very small uh, company. It's based out of France. Uh, they have been very focused on a novel uh, approach, a novel drug, uh, which hopefully will come on the market in the next few years. So while the numbers right now on that stock that we see on the screen are not the strongest, I do want to point out that their clinical trial and study called Aptect will be coming out with its results within the next uh, few weeks. So recently their CEO, bought 120,000 shares, which obviously we could speculate it was to hype up how the company is going to perform. But I do think that because of the novelty of protein that they are currently developing and in already phase three trial, uh, there's a lot of potential. That would be really focused on ulcerative colitis, which in the U.S. affects over a million people and globally many more. Uh, but if their molecule and their protein is actually very successful in its novelty, it won't just affect UC, uh, but it could also be implemented for Crohn's disease. And from there on, we're talking ab about a brand new class of drugs. Um, although the market is already saturated with the big pharmaceutical companies producing um, already products that address UC, I do think that this one is very novel um, for multiple reasons, and I would love to see how how it performs. Again, this is a very much long-term prediction that I have because the FDA would only get them, uh, give them approval if they've passed two phase three trials and we're still on the first one. But as I mentioned, they've already done uh, a lot of work in the Crohn's disease space and they have a phase two right now uh, with the FDA for Crohn's disease specifically. 
ABVX is the ticker symbol. It's trading right now. It's up four percent today. It's up six. It's at six and a quarter today. Six dollars, right? Um, I did see on April 30th a $33 price target from JMP Securities. They have a market outperform, so they too seem to be believers that this could be a winner. I absolutely can't wait to see the results. I, I think that they're very realistic. And again, Aptech, which they uh, the company said will post the phase three trial results any minute, um, will really be a game changer for them. So again, we're not only talking about uh, one disease area, we're talking about what in the medical world we call novelty drugs, and it could be a whole class of drugs. Also, the current in the US and obviously globally, the current production of the specific type of medication that they're trying to tackle is very heavily focused on injectables. Why this is considered novel, and I have no doubt they will be very successful if the Aptact phase three trial shows success, is because this is actually oral. It will be an oral medication, which will really be groundbreaking novel in its way that it tackles unmet patient needs. So right now, if we look at basically the discussions around ulcerative colitis uh, globally, I mean, patients consistently talk about the pain of their unmet needs that they have when it comes to how current, uh, for example, Yanis Kinase inhibitors and immunosuppressants address ulcerative colitis. So Abivax is coming with this novel method of how they plan on helping these patients um, in their daily suffering. So I Again, I feel very positively about this one. I do have to say, I think we're still very far from any big moves in terms of um, how the growth of uh, their stock would perform, uh, just because they're still far away from FDA approval uh, and ears out. But I have no doubt within the short span, if Aptact uh, comes out with success, that they'll probably get uh, swooped off the market and, and acquired by someone big. Yeah, and well, you know, um, Feta, is there any name that I left out? I know you liked uh, Eli Lilly as well. Oh, I love, I love talking about diabetes and weight loss. I mean, Eli, Eli Lilly, if we examine their performance um, and we look at the stock, I just cannot not mention that over the last couple of years, uh, their uh, stock has skyrocketed since 2023. If you actually look at uh, what drugs they've been focused on since then, it's heavily GLP-1, um, drugs which are, again, weight loss and diabetes. And they recently um, have been really focused on the race to get Monjaro to actually be the uh, competitor of Zempic uh, in this oversaturated or um, very heavily focused market when it comes to weight loss drugs. Um, they do. They are at ASCO right now, which is one of the largest um, congresses in the world, um, and they are presenting uh, very interesting data findings. Uh, so very focused on pain management, which is, I think, after GLP-1 will be probably their largest focus. Um, but again, like if you look at their uh, marketing campaigns and their overall positioning uh, so stock wise, they've been performing very steadily and very strongly. Uh, brand wise and marketing wise, they have been very focused on GLP-1, but slowly transitioning the brand messaging into pain management and again, pain medication that are non opioid, which again is very uh, different approach in terms of how some of the other players are talking about uh, this class of drugs. And just quickly on the um, Abivax, which, you know, we were talking about being at $6. I saw price targets for $12 and $33. And you said it's phase three trial that they're working on, but they actually need two phase three trials and FDA approval. So it's sort of early in the game. How long can that take? I mean, if someone were to invest and buy it today, thinking, wow, this sounds interesting. I'd like to get in this. When might they see the returns? Are we talking years? Is it six to 12 months? Yeah, great question. So when it comes to medical clinical trials and how those work, we are definitely talking ears. And I'll tell you why. In a recent interview, their CEO talked about, Abivax's CEO talked about 
um, how much funding they needed to do in order to be even able to do a phase three trial. We're talking about 30, 50, or even more millions of dollars to be able to even begin a clinical trial, which then has a specific duration that it has to pass. So once you start the clinical trial, we have to give time for the patients to basically uh, come back and, and show us the actual results over the span of sometimes we're talking years. So phase three will end for Abivax. It was announced. Will Results will be an, announced within the next few weeks, after which it is very possible. FDA most of the time does require minimum two phase three trials in order to prove efficacy and to prove safety, because we are talking about the safety of the patients when it comes to these trials. So I would say if you're an investor and you are looking for novel approaches into possibly class of drugs, so again, tar targeting more than one disease areas, buy, the, buy it, but make sure you're in for the long haul because this is definitely a few years from any success. Yeah, yeah. It's great to see you, Sveta. Thank you. Sveta Thank you Kalinska. So Thank you, of Ryla Global. Now George Silas is here. Oh, you have the TS like she has the TS. And let's talk, George Sillis, about the example trade. You're looking at biotech stock and you're looking at Johnson & Johnson as our example trade today. Good morning, George. Yes. Yeah, so looking at Johnson & Johnson, I think that uh, this one is sort of a steady mover. In other words, you see it's actually trading within a range between 165 high and about 140 low, at least in the last year. Uh, and it's actually a, a pretty significant dividend pair from a from a mega cap name in the uh, in the biotech and pharma space. So we have to take that into consideration here as well. But ideally speaking, it's starting to move closer to the 50 and 200 day moving averages as a confluence area. So that kind of means that right now the stock is sort of stationary in this trading range. But uh, ideally speaking, there's a couple of ways to trade this. One, you could buy stock outright to participate in the dividend. The second thing you could do is consider um, buying a long synthetic combo. So this is synthesizing a long stock position trade. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out to uh, to the July expiration with about 74 days uh, in this one, and I'm going to basically buy the $150 call option, then simultaneously sell the $150 put option. And uh, altogether, this would cost you about $4 a share or $400 a contract. So in essence, uh, if you place this trade, you want the stock to move higher, obviously, over time between now and expiration uh, in the next 74 days. But at the same time, by placing this trade, if the stock ends up trading below the 150 area between now and expiration, you would be assigned 100 shares of stock. And ideally speaking, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea considering the, uh, the company does pay a dividend. So in this case, in lieu of basically spending over $15,000 to buy 100 shares for $400 per share, you could certainly synthesize a long stock position, but your break even again is $154, which is not too far off the current price. All right, and then uh, should we turn our attention over to Eli Lilly? This is one, you're gonna take us through a trade here, an example trade. Yeah, so in the previous one, we looked at August. This one, we're gonna look at July with a bit more narrow time frame. With Eli Lilly, one of the things you gotta keep in mind is irrespective of the bullishness in their products and the sentiment around the weight loss drugs, the stock is actually trading near the, near the lower end of a trading range, right around the $700 area, where it actually established these areas going back to several time periods, November, uh, January of this year, even March, and, and actually the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to use that level as an area of support, and I'm going to sell a put spread uh, at the $700 strike price. So I'm selling the $700 put. I'm going to buy the 680 put below that. So. In this case, you're harvesting about $6 a share in credit or about $600 a contract. So the whole premise behind this trade is the stock to hold between now and the 46-day expiration, the $700 area. Yeah, that premium will erode to zero, but you've got to consider the risk because your total return is $6. Your risk is $14. Uh, break even on the trade is $694 if it does go to that level. And then your max loss is $14 a share if the stock hits $680 or lower by expiration. All right, uh, George Sillis, thank you so much. Uh, look there, we appreciate it.